Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome people who came in person and also all of the uh, audience of the MLX Met who are attending virtually. My name is Kehan Batman Gelich. I'm assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering at Boston University. And this is our second talk of MLX Met seminar series for spring 24. So MLX Met seminar was a seminar that started back in 2020. And it's a seminar held between University of Pittsburgh, Boston University, University of Toronto, and Carnegie Mellon and UPMC. The focus of these talks are new method, real world application and deployment of the machine learning um, on, on various application. So the today's seminar is co-sponsored by Hariri Institute, and it's my pleasure to introduce Tristan here. Before starting the talk, a couple of announcements. We have two upcoming talks. On one is February 9 by Alan Wang from Cornell University, and another talk on 23rd on Ross uh, Greiner from the University of Alberta. Please feel free to uh, attend those talks. All of those, the talks are public and will be recorded. So a little bit of logistic for today. Um, for those of you who haven't attended this talk, uh, if you are attending the talk in person, uh, please hold your, we appreciate if you hold your question all the way to the end. We are going to pass the microphone around so that you can ask your question. For those of people in the audience who are attending virtually, um, at the end of the talk, please uh, raise your hand and we'll open your microphone so that you can have a discussion with Tristan. Um, the talk today will be recorded and will be released through the YouTube channel of the Hariri. And with that note, uh, I'd like to introduce Tristan. Tristan Nauman is a principal researcher in the Real World Evidence, RWA E group at Microsoft Research Health Future. His research focuses on problem at the intersection of machine learning and health, and is specifically exploring relationship in a complex, unstructured health data using technique from natural language processing and unsupervised learning. He values supporting the broader machine learning community through academic service and has served as a general chair and a variety of other roles for uh, NeurIPS, AHLI conference on health, and in France and machine learning, CHILL, and machine learning for health, ML4H. And uh, this is my great pleasure to welcome you and looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as, as was just mentioned, I, I'm Tristan. Uh, I work with Microsoft Research's Health Futures, and today I'll be talking with you about real-world evidence uh, in this age of LLMs. And I think this is an extremely exciting topic, in part because LLMs are pervasive across both general domain and uh, health domain now, uh, but also because they're, they're sort of captured the public interest. And so I often joke that with a family who is in a non-technical area, this is one of the few times in my life where they've asked me about things that I actually work on. Um, and that's, that's quite exciting. But let me, let me tell you a little bit about uh, my, my specific interest in sort of text at large and, and sort of healthcare. So I, I sort of got into this space with the idea that actually a lot of the future of medicine resides somewhere in the text that's written about patients. And the intuition here was really this idea that you know, all of the things that we know are really important. We know that maybe heart rate is a really important measure of cardiovascular health. We have come up with ways to measure that with really high frequency, really high fidelity. All of the other things that we think are important, but not yet important enough or important enough in a known way, all of that just got dumped in the notes somewhere. And so whether it's sort of a note for your future self or for someone else in the care chain, we think that these things are important, but again, we don't yet know that they're important enough to sort of structure. And so I got into this space thinking, well, why don't we try to pull out some of that information and, and sort of rapidly structure it for some of these providers so they can actually do the studies they'd like to do now rather than waiting to try to collect it or hiring people to pull that information out of the notes. And more recently, I've really become you know, quite interested in the space of multimodal models in part because that's sort of uh, methodologically where a number of uh, people in the field are moving, but also because it's really this opportunity to unlock new facets of health and get better representations of patients as a whole. So patients, of course, as, as much as I might like text, are not just generating text data in a care setting. They're generating lots of signals, lots of images, um, lots of the other modalities that I've talked with several people here about earlier today as well. And so if we really want to build models that represent those same patients, 
we, we really need to factor in all of that data. And so, you know, I, I think maybe, especially in the context of healthcare, we care maybe about two things foremost. Does it work, right? And, and is it actually safe to use in a healthcare setting? And I, I think both of these questions have really been at the, at the forefront of a lot of literature recently. And I, I think what is quite nice is that when we think about real world data that's written about patients across a variety of settings, um, as I'll talk about later, I work quite heavily now in the oncology space, so patients with cancers. Um, we see time and time again that the data that they're generating really is providing crucial evidence for their outcomes and for their care. And then this other question about is it safe, there are a number of questions about this and specifically about what it means to, for example, have hallucinations or just outright mistakes that some of our tools make. And really what, what we're finding is that, you know, if we think about some of these tools, they are, they are certainly fallible, um, but there are ways to design some of the systems that they're deployed in that allow us to mitigate some of those risks and then also generate feedback to continuously improve as well. And this is really causing us to rethink a lot of the way that we have historically thought about AI in the health domain. And I, I think these are sort of some initial examples, a, a, an initial paper about maybe emergent capability in general domain, a book that was looking at, uh, you know, how do we actually apply some of these LLMs in the context of healthcare, and then also discussion of some of the benefits, uh, limits, and risks of, of the deployment of these tools in healthcare settings. But even as early as last year, we started seeing a substantial number of, of real deployments, right? Or, or at least proofs of concepts that would lend to real deployments. And I, I think this is an interesting one, in part because it was illustrating that actually, at times, these automated tools were performing with characteristics that we might find more desirable than some of the underlying human responses that we were getting. And, and on the one hand, this is quite concerning because we, we typically assume that humans are going to have and be able to provide the best care. Uh, on the other hand, it's sort of interesting because maybe it's an opportunity to have tools that better complement some of the existing human capacity. And so I've, I've really actually liked some of, the, some of these recent articles that have looked at, you know, what are the opportunities that exist with LLMs? And I, I don't want to pretend that there are not potential harms as well. Those certainly exist, and I think they are well described in a lot of the literature that's emerging. Um, but this recent paper from Emma Pearson and a number of others was really looking at, you know, among the fraction of papers that's looking at harms and opportunities, you know, what are some of the opportunities that we really see? And they identified uh, several that are here really looking around the detection of bias, the use of LLMs to detect bias, the use of LLMs to create data sets that hold equity relevant information. So things like automatic extraction of social determinants of health that might actually allow us to provide better care than the standard of care that we currently have. Um, LLMs as a mechanism for accessibility. Um, you know, we often think about data science in hospital settings existing where a, a clinician maybe has this idea, they work with a number of people, maybe they can actually ask that question directly of the data that they have access to now. Um, and then also some, some facets of how LLMs can improve equity and matching systems. And I'll talk a little bit about some of our group's work in, in matching systems in a moment. And I think together, all of this presents a really interesting opportunity for this, this world of real world evidence. And, and there's a lot of sort of corporate interest in this space, unsurprisingly. But I think there are some real problems that we can start to look at. So if we, if we sort of maybe consider um, clinical trials as a concrete example, there's this really interesting thing that happens in the oncology space for clinical trials. So on the one hand, we see a very small fraction of patients actually enrolled in trials. And I have 3% here, but the numbers on any given year tend to range between 2 and 6%. And we see a number of trials fail because of insufficient number of patients. And so if you think about this, this doesn't make a ton of sense. It seems like there's an unmet need on both sides of this equation. There's an unmet need from the patient side who want to be maybe in trials that are life-saving. And then there's an unmet need on the, the sort of pharmaceutical side for these trials that are failing and costing a ton of money. And so when we think about this, we might think, you know, what are, what are some things that we can do here? And uh, for our group specifically, we've been considering how large language models maybe provide this mechanism of universal structuring to unlock value in that, in that proposition and really try to better align some of the need. So I'll, I'll run through sort of an example and then I'll, I'll drop into some topics around biomedical uh, LLMs and sort of like how we got to this place with biomedical LLMs and some, some ongoing research. But I, I wanna start with sort of a motivating example because I thought this was a pretty exciting thing from last year. So we, we looked initially at this problem around clinical trial matching, specifically in this oncology space. And, and the sort of immediate question was, 
you know, we have sort of two sides of this equation. We have the eligibility criteria that are defined in the, in the trials, in something like clinicaltrials.gov, and then we have the patient criteria on the other side. And so this is uh, scrolling very fast, unfortunately, but is maybe an example of the type of uh, trial that you would find from clinicaltrials.gov. And so we were looking just initially at, could we use GPT in this case as a mechanism to say, take this trial, it's a lot of unstructured text, turn it into something that's first order logic constraints. So for, for those of you from CS backgrounds, it would look something like this, some combination of ands, ors, and nots that connect a whole bunch of the trial eligibility criteria in such a way that we can you know, use, use like a satisfiability solver or something like that on the other side. And what we found actually was, was quite interesting. Um, I will admit that I was initially extremely skeptical of the uh, ability of a tool to do this. But what we found was that you know, beyond being able to do this task, it was actually able to do this task quite well and better than a lot of the bespoke tools that had been created before it to specifically do that task. And this is a really interesting finding, again, I mean, for me, because it sort of defied maybe my original intuition, uh, but it's also a really interesting one because it lends to this idea that maybe we can use LLMs as a mechanism to sort of instantly bring structure to some of these unstructured sources that we've been working with in a very low-cost way, at least a very time, uh, a not time-intensive way. So, you know, we, we, of course, maybe as you can imagine, are looking at this on, now on the other side of the the patient side to see you know, if we can structure the trial, could we also structure the patient? And in some sort of earlier studies, we looked at you know, the types of patients that we have in these oncology settings. This is sort of an illustration of the different types of just note data that come in for a specific patient. And you can see it's sort of all over the place. We, we have maybe very infrequently a number of uh, procedure reports that are generated. We have maybe much more frequently encounter reports that are generated with the patient over time. I should mention actually also that all data that is shown in this presentation, none of it is real patient data. So um, no, no concern there that uh, it's exposing patient data, but this is sort of an example of what you might expect. And you know, if you look at the different types of notes, they vary in the types of information they contain as well. You might have a pathology report that sort of has something very specific about a pathology sample that was taken. Uh, similarly, these encounter reports, maybe they're more frequent but less informative. And so what we were looking at was a set of projects around can we structure specific types of information from these patient notes um, and we looked specifically to developing models for this, this specific provider. So we were working closely with our collaborators at Providence Healthcare, and we're able to generate a, a few models that are able to identify tumor staging information quite rapidly for them. And so this is sort of our, our initial proof point to look at, you know, if we can do this for one of these, can we do this more broadly for a number of things that are parts of eligibility criteria as well? And so I think, again, this, this lends quite well to this notion that you know, maybe GPT uh, is a mechanism to structure some of the real-world data that we have. And these are maybe just initial sort of promising test points. Um, but again, also, I'll, as I'll talk about later, these are, these are sort of zero-shot structuring results. So when we're thinking about this, this is probably the lower bound of what we'd expect in terms of performance. There are a lot of things we can do to try to improve or bolster performance beyond that and make that really usable in a real-world setting. And, and I think um, you know, what, what's also quite exciting about this, too, is one of the things that we found during the course of the study is we'd stood up you know, a, a, maybe an interface to test the types of models that we were making. And then we started seeing you know, actually a real, a real demand for usage. And so, so this, you, you, know, you can sort of imagine what some of these types of things might look like. But when we were thinking about how we might do something like clinical trial matching, we might, for example, want to have a more patient-centric view, something that you can look at a patient's record and you can quite instantly see, you know, here is a corresponding trial that might be available based on the sort of uh, drug, uh, the, the genes and variant, or genes and mutations that sort of exist for this patient, various biomarkers, and then pull up the relevant information from that trial uh, for, or from the literature to understand how we can best actually go about treating them. And so I think what's really interesting for me about this is I, I often looked at this process as, you know, why, why as a patient am I often not able to make some of these decisions for myself, or why does it feel like my provider is burdened with having to know everything about medicine in order to provide the appropriate, um, the appropriate care for me? And so this is maybe a mechanism for, to get that information to them in a timely way, much more efficiently. So I, I wanna sort of, uh, like I said, I, I think this is a good motivating example. I, I think I, I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, like how did we get here? And I, I think the way, that I've often done this in the past is sort of provide like a brief history of NLP and a brief history of deep learning and talk about sort of where the two of them intersect. And I think for today what I'll do instead is just sort of start at 
where they've recently intersected rather than do the, the whole history. But if others want to talk about it afterwards, I love talking about both. And so I, I'm happy to, to answer questions about it or, or uh, talk one on one about it as well. But I think what we're seeing now is we, we've seen this recent sort of consolidation across these two fields, especially NLP and deep learning, really oriented primarily around this notion of a transformer, um, but then also around these sort of these axes of you know, what are the right modalities, um, some advances in self-supervised learning, and then also some pieces related to prompts and instruction following. And so just to really briefly recap for, for those in the audience who maybe are not as familiar with it, the, the, transfer, the transformer architecture fundamentally sort of comprises an encoder-decoder style network. Um, and the encoder is, is quite similar, um, but it adds this, this bit of sort of self-attention here, right? So um, what's really interesting about self-attention is that, uh, and, and the corresponding positional encoding as well, is that it sort of gives you this notion that certain words in a sequence are related to other words in that sequence, which you can imagine why that, that might be you know, really important. And you can also imagine putting constraints on the directionality of some of those relationships. And so that actually allows us to define a few different classes, the, the sort of bi-directional class, um, which, or maybe no direction, depending on how you think of it, that is primarily consisting of, of BERT-based models. Uh, this sort of uh, unidirectional uh, model, or this, uh, often called this like causal model, that's looking at sort of things like, like GPT. Um, but in general, self-attention sort of provides this notion of, of contextualization, regardless of sort of these other constraints that are, that are provided. And so you'll see you know, this transformer architecture appear in, in basically all of these different models that emerged. Um, what's really nice about this architecture, though, is that it actually works across multiple modalities. So um, you, know, you, you can actually also start looking at vision with things like vision transformers. And this is maybe similar to the way that previously, you know, CNNs tended to work quite well in the, the vision space and the imaging domain, and then were brought over, in many cases, the NLP domain, um, or similarly with, with other architectures as well. And it also works even for things like molecular simulation. And so this fundamental architecture is a very nice composable basis for working across a variety of different modalities. But what we've used it for largely currently is, is a lot of work in the, the language space and, and also the imaging space. Um, of course, because it can work across a variety of modalities, it's really a nice candidate for working across a variety of modalities in healthcare. As I mentioned, there's also this sort of classic, um, this, this classic problem that we're starting to realize with advances in self-supervised learning. But if you think about like the traditional deep learning uh, framing, you're, you're pretty dependent on a really large amount of labeled data. So you often have this setup where you're going to have some training data, you're going to train on that training data, you're going to test on some new data. Uh, after you've trained a model. But you really need those instances. You need that, that combination of, of training instance and then the corresponding label with it. I, I had some great conversations earlier about how actually there might not just be one label that's the appropriate label. And I, I think that's a, a really interesting area to explore more. But, but more broadly with self-supervised learning, what we really want to try to make use of is the reality of the situation in healthcare, which is we often have an abundance of unlabeled data. We maybe have some, some amount of labeled data but if we do, it's probably a very small fraction of what we have in this sort of unlabeled area. And, and we also have some notion of domain knowledge that we don't want to just forget, right? You know, we, we look at a lot of the data, even if we look at sort of these well-known data sets like Mimic, there are these examples in Mimic where you see values in structured ways. You, you'll see, for example, a blood pressure that is actually so high that the person would be like exploding uh, as a result if they actually had that blood pressure, clearly an error. So we know that there's sort of domain knowledge that we can apply to say, look, that's, that's an implausibly high value. Um, you know, there's a difference between an outlier and something that, that's just not physiologically possible. And so self-supervised learning in many ways offers this path forward for leveraging both the, the labeled data if we have it, but then also making use of this sort of abundance of unlabeled data in a task agnostic way typically, and then also using some of the domain knowledge that we have in this sort of very task specific framing. And so I'll, I'll walk through really quickly just a, a, an example of what this looks like in, in pre-training. You know, if we consider something like natural language model pre-training, maybe early on if we looked at something like the mass language modeling objective from BERT, effectively you, you look at some unlabeled text and you say, well, what can I do with this? Well, I, I can just you know, mask a whole bunch of things here. And then I've created this really interesting task for myself because effectively what I can do is I know what the answer is already. I know what those underlying words are. So I can you know, come up with a task that is to, to effectively predict the things that I masked previously. And, and this is really interesting because it uh, 
closely approximate some of the existing things we're doing in language modeling, but with much longer range dependencies potentially, uh, because it removes some of the computational costs associated with uh, the, the very long chain afterwards. And similarly, if we look at, you know, we can add a constraint to that and say, let's, let's only look at next word prediction, right? And this is a really interesting task as well, where we're doing effectively that mass language modeling objective with this constraint that it's always the last word. And one of the things that's emerged there that's quite interesting is if you think about language and the sort of breadth of things that we experience in language or that we write down in language, this is actually, a, you know, another, you can think of this as a, effectively like a massively multitask prediction task. Um, and, and this is because there are so many different things that it could be or so many different tasks that are sort of underlying that, um, you know, this can actually stand in for a variety of other tasks, making it a very powerful tool for actually performing a lot of those tasks. And it's also sort of shifted a lot of the, 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 t the ways that we think about some of these models to look at notions of things like prompting. So, you know, whereas Bert maybe gave us a, a new sort of pipeline for working with a lot of different types of models and text data, GPT gave us a new formulation for a lot of the tasks, where a lot of the underlying task, rather than sort of coming up with that task and coding it out and things like that, um, we really are able to much more freely sort of interact with this model and, and turn that task into sort of like an a, a ask, ask of the model. And this has also afforded a number of other things about how do we actually incorporate feedback and information into those models. So, you know, I, I think the, the, the big ones that we see now are things like, you know, instruction fine tuning, uh, reinforcement learning, human feedback, uh, not mentioned here, but also really fascinating paper from earlier, or from last year now, I guess, uh, is things related to like direct, direct preference optimization, which give you a really nice reformulation of maybe uh, reinforcement learning for with human feedback. Uh, that allows you to sort of uh, get rid of one of the networks that's typically used there. And, and this is, you know, unsurprisingly, because of this sort of accessibility, we're starting to see these models used, uh, you know, pervasively in the literature, right? So I, I think may, maybe anecdotally, I, we had a number of interns last year who, uh, at the time they were joining, were very excited to, of course, not shift their project entirely, but sort of incorporate LLMs in, a, in some way into their project. And, and I think we see this more broadly across the set of submissions to archive. I, I know, uh, you know, having worked with NeurIPS this last year, we also saw this certainly at NeurIPS and, and all of the sort of interesting related questions around how we consider use of LLM um, in various other facets of NeurIPS as well. But, you know, I, I think one of the things that is likely to continue is that we'll, we'll continue to see sort of increased usage uh, in part just because we're lowering the barrier to entry for using some of these tools. And I think the other thing that's really, you know, a, a moving trend here is, of course, the growth of model size. And, and so this is, this is actually sort of an interesting, um, an interesting thing, because this is looking at from 2018 uh, to, to just about 2022. And so, the, you know, by, by our current time scale, really old, uh, long ago, but I remember saying, you know, in, in 2018, 2019, I was working on large language models, and they were at the very left side here. And so they were, by today's standards, no means large. Um, but, you know, I think the, the notion of large has sort of increased quite rapidly. And if we, you know, now look at even just this last, more recent time frame, you know, we're moving not even from this multi-billion, but up to this, you know, trillion uh, sort of parameterized models. And, and so, and, and of course, uh, you know, with releases like Gemini and all these other sorts of things, we're, we're left guessing for what some of the actual size of the models are, but at the same time, we know that they, you know, they, or we assume they must be incredibly large. And, and what's most interesting about this, this sort of really large model is that it seems like increasingly we're able to get sort of surprising task performance out of some of these really large models. When we look, this is a general domain example, but when we look you know, at a handful of, this is a, a large, uh, uh, an example from a little while ago about sort of the emergent abilities of large language models. But maybe this emergent ability is really just this notion of, you know, things that we're unexpected, uh, we're unexpected from the underlying model that we're working with. And so we, we started to see many places, these performances on tasks that, again, we might not have expected because they weren't there and the, we, there was nothing in the training data that would lead us to believe that this was actually gonna be the case or because, you know, it's, it's just something that uh, doesn't, you know, it's able to sort of compose from a whole bunch of different examples something that is fundamentally new. And this effective scale, I think actually is, you know, while I, I often think about it in the language space, I think it's actually most easily seen. Um, you know, if we look at scale, you know, if we go back a little while ago, this is a, an example from 
uh, one of the, the papers that, that Google had provided was, you know, they were looking at, let's, let's just sort of increase the size of the model. So we look at, you know, 350 million parameter model. This is this portrait of a kangaroo wearing an orange hoodie, blue sunglasses, uh, standing on the grass in front of the Sydney Opera House, um, you know, with this sign. And it's, it's, you know, it's not very good with these smaller models, but it starts to get better and better. Uh, and, and better, you know, to the point where it's these sort of hyper-realistic things. And I, I was talking with a few people today about how, you know, the impact of what this means in medicine and how maybe actually like for these 20 billion uh, parameter models, maybe this is a bad thing, you know, when we try to do things like generate ex chest x-rays, um, we get really cool looking chest x-rays that are awesome for putting on a slide, but actually not based in the reality of what a chest x-ray looks like to a radiologist. And some of the incredible things that people are doing to really try to make those actually more grounded in what uh, radiologists normally see. So I'll talk a little bit uh, also now about, about sort of biomedical LLMs, you know, because I, I think this is sort of general, general setting for, you know, how, how do we sort of get here. And so when I think about biomedical uh, and clinical uh, as well, I, I often think about a couple things. So, so the first one is, you know, general domain, we tend to have both really large data, but we also have lots of access to labeled data, in part because of things like CAPTCHA. Um, I, I put this together uh, actually after failing a number of these, like, find the red lights things. Uh, which, well, either suggests that I'm missing a lot of lights in real life or alternatively that their uh, captioning tasks are, are not great. But, but, you know, if you think about a, a sort of a domain-specific task like this, like find the pneumonia, um, may, maybe I could do this now after having worked on radiology and chest x-ray images for a long time, but, but this is not like general knowledge. I think most of us would just hit skip and move on to the next thing. Um, although actually some of the radiologists I've told, <laughs> Talk to have said they really want this rather than uh, what they are answering to get into their various accounts now as well. Um, but then, you know, I think the other thing that's always interesting too is that, you know, when we think about the types of way, the, the ways that we use language to describe some of the things in medicine, it's, it's a very different usage than in general domain. So, so for example, you know, like in this, in this lower uh, picture over here, when we're looking at these like two cows grazing in the field, like maybe like canonical image net sort of, sort of example. We would never describe this image by saying there's no dinosaur in this picture, right? But, but in medicine, we do this all the time. You know, we have some notion, like a, a patient was sent in for some condition, and we'll say there's no sign of, of you know, pneumonia. There's no sign of, of you know, some, some other sort of condition in this, in this image. And so there's, there's sort of this like fundamental difference in the way that we describe some of the images that maybe also suggests that like we, we should be a little suspicious of things in general domain doing well in medicine. I'll, I'll actually talk to why that might not be the case, but uh, uh, you know, I think it's, it's sort of an interesting uh, counterpoint that I, I often think about going into these spaces. And, and then the other one is also just this notion of, you know, what has it historically looked like to have data in this space? You know, we often talk about data siloing and things like that, um, but the reality is for a lot of the public resources, in NLP at least, they, they were generated over a decade later. So uh, Mark Dodzi gave a wonderful talk at Clinical NLP two years ago that was specifically talking about the progression of sort of NLP from his point of view, and then sort of the progression of clinical NLP, again from his point of view, and how it sort of consistently lagged about a decade behind. And this was because when we look at things like Penn Tree Bank, um, most people will not remember this, but for some of us, uh, we might remember when it came out on CD and you could actually like, get the CD uh, with Penn Tree Bank data. Um, any comparable data set, things like I2B2, over a decade later. And so this is really concerning because it's just sort of this, this amount of labeled data has existed, again, with such a delay that I think it really lends to us needing to come up with you know, better solutions. I, I mean, we also probably need labeled data, but uh, also coming up with sort of more creative solutions around what we do in the absence of labeled data. So with those two things sort of in mind, I, I'll, I'll talk about you know, why LLMs, I think, are, are sort of interesting uh, from this biomedical standpoint. And, and in part, you know, there, there's sort of three maybe major shifts. But they all relate to this one thing, which is you know, the most prominent change being uh, you have this sort of general purpose interface for a variety of different language understanding and generation tasks. And so if we, if we sort of break that down, you know, like what does this actually mean? This sort of means on the one hand, there's sort of this move maybe from specialist models to the sort of like notion of generalist models. Uh, another one from this sort of notion, oh, sorry, another one from this sort of notion of uh, closed set classification. So this is, I think, maybe what many of us are most familiar with. It, it shows up very frequently in benchmarks for machine learning to this notion of sort of open-ended generation rather than just, again, like, you know, predict from a set. 
Um, and also to maybe a degree as well, like this, this shift away from maybe representation learning to promptable interfaces. And so I'll, I'll sort of walk through maybe each of these briefly to illustrate like what that, what that actually means in medicine. So you know, if we think about what we used to work on in NLP, you know, maybe we were looking at like a clinical dialogue and we wanted to go to some, some patient note. And so that was a summariz summarization task. And we had a whole bunch of us working specifically on summarization. But then you, know, you actually wanted to do something else, something, something maybe related to like entity recognition or relation extraction or text classification. And these were all sort of like different areas. And they actually subdivided the NLP community at large into various subcommunities where we were all working on these sort of different tasks. We had different benchmarks. We were working uh, very hard to identify a whole bunch of these sort of clinically relevant things uh, on the right here to identify various pieces of relevant information from patient notes uh, or various inf information about patients. And a lot of the research at this time really focused on how can we develop much better features and model architectures to learn these sort of task-specific models. And, and so I think you know, in this sort of first shift, uh, what we really saw was, OK, well, maybe what we can do instead is learn some shared composite representation, you know, this transformer representation, perhaps, and then really focus on these task-specific headers. Like, let's do fine-tuning with that task. Let's try to leverage a better form of transfer learning. Let's just try to apply that, that sort of specific task in the very last um, portion so that we can not only do this specific task that we care about, but then also have sort of baked in some of the knowledge from some of these other tasks that might actually be helpful for really uh, any, any of the other tasks as well. And so it was sort of this shift, again, toward like a, a backbone sort of structure. And in the biodomedical domain, uh, we had sort of uh, started some work on this very early, uh, a model called PubMedBert that then we later renamed BiomedBert. And, and I think what was really fascinating about that shift was it really changed the way that we were making models, and it changed very rapidly how many different tasks we could consider. Like I had never, for example, worked in summarization previously, and all of a sudden I found myself doing a ton of summarization. And so again, this sort of notion of pre-training to fine-tuning is maybe the, that first major shift. And the, the sort of you know, second thing when we, when we sort of think about these like generalist models is, is maybe you could actually shift this entirely to just, just an LLM, right? Like the, the whole thing could be an LLM. And so when we think about um, what this actually means, it, it's really this notion that like from the various components where we were doing these task-specific headers, we could potentially collapse this down to just a single very large model. So when we think about the, the closed set uh, and open set generation, maybe similarly by analogy, you know, the this, this summarization piece, you know, we were thinking about these tasks maybe where there's, there's a limited set of labels or they're sort of predefined. And, and you know, we were doing a lot of work in this space, but we're really looking at like, let's go ahead and say, you know, does this condition exist? Yes, no. Um, like frame this as a prediction, frame this as something that machine learning does quite, quite well. You know, the, can't, the, the, the sort of model underlying that we're expecting is going to answer, you know, this is an entity type from some pre, predefined set of entities. This is a relation from some predefined set of relations, right? And we saw sort of the same, you know, shift now where rather than, you know, doing this sort of predefined set on, on the right, we could start looking at, let's, let's just start looking at just giving us a summary and giving us sort of an answer. Um, you know, and, th and that really opens up a lot of opportunities where we can start answering types of other things like USMLE type questions or, or various facets of clinical dialogue that were really difficult to do previously. Maybe similarly, um, you know, this last piece is really this notion that we can move away maybe from some of the representation learning that we were doing. So previously, you know, there was this huge emphasis on sort of representation learning for a number of reasons, part of which was really how can we get generalizability and how can we also have some model that's agnostic to the underlying tasks that we're looking at. And so what this really looked at is, you know, if we look at the, the representation learning piece, it was really expensive often. It was, it was very engineering heavy. Um, I think many of us liked it, maybe for that reason. It was like a really satisfying thing to sort of train some of these models, have them run for a long time, see a better and better model. But then it was also often quite task specific. And, and so, you know, moving to this sort of notion of a promptable interface where you could sort of freeze the underlying model and then sort of do some of the, the probing, or, or alternatively, not even freeze the model, but just do some of the probing, um, is quite nice, I think, for many of us, but also opens up accessibility to a whole different set of users. And I think it's this latter piece that is, is really fascinating in the medical domain. Uh, 
It's also led to a lot of confusion. I think often when I, when I talk with a number of clinicians or I see a lot of their talks, I think some of the talks can be really hyperbolic. You'll see these, um, these examples that are provided to sort of ground our intuition, but they'll, they'll often be these, these sort of extremes, you know, like look at, the, look at the ability of this model to do something, we're all gonna be out of jobs soon, look at this silly mistake that it made, we're never gonna use these things for real. Um, but I think that's actually an incredibly healthy facet that lends to how these things are actually being used by a different audience than they were previously. And you know, as with sort of general domain, this, this led to a really large number of biomedical LLMs, you know, uh, maybe from you know, BioGPT, BioBert, Bio CyBert, PubMedBert, like all of these have sort of become staples for a lot of the language tasks that we're doing today. And maybe to just comment on one of them, so this is very early work, but it brings up something that I think is very salient as a, as a very open question right now, which is, you know, do we need actually this notion of domain-specific pre-training? So early on, uh, we, we sort of assumed actually you really would need some notion of domain-specific pre-training. Um, and, and, you know, there are a number of things in this space, you know, you look at something like MedPalm or, or Dragon or, or PubMed GPT, but the, the, the sort of underlying question here really was, you know, like why, why, might, we, why might we need this, right? So like the, the initial endeavor was really this endeavor in looking at could we pre-train from scratch a large language model because we saw really good performance from things like BERT, but we also saw a lot of places where it didn't really work. And it was very, you know, it, initially it was somewhat confusing, like why, why would this be the case? And so the, the sort of hypothesis was really, we don't have enough in-domain data in this original data set that the, that the model was pre-trained on. And so, you know, we, we saw some early evidence for this, specifically when we looked at the underlying tokenization and the vocabularies involved, uh, you know, for something like BERT, we saw that it was breaking a lot of words in the biomedical domain in really odd ways that we wouldn't have expected. And on, on the one hand, you know, the model should be able to shift this to the under, underlying capacity of the network that's doing the prediction or the identification or representation of these terms. On the other hand, maybe we do want something that actually allows us to better represent these specific concepts that we really care about in these domains uh, more naturally. And so this led to sort of this, again, this sort of uh, creation of a, a PubMed BERT where we were specifically aiming to preserve the integrity of, of specific biomedical terms that we noticed were being misrepresented or poorly represented. And so this is, you know, this notion of a domain-specific vocabulary as opposed to one where, where all the words are getting shattered into these various pieces. And uh, what we're seeing, of course, is actually this model is still being used pretty heavily now. But, you know, there is this real question about now in, you know, in 2024, um, you know, what does it look like to actually just move to sort of this general domain model? Because there are a tremendous number of models. Like, I often end up thinking about GBT because of uh, my own access, but, you know, there are, of course, things like BARD, uh, Claude, all of these other sort of uh, models that are available and a huge number of resources to work with them as well. And so when we think about these, these sets of models, I, I just want to sort of like group these, um, although I think it's, it's more just uh, for, for a reference point for everybody. There's maybe sort of three classes. There's this like encoder only, and that's typically what I, I mean when I say BERT, and I'll maybe talk with some folks about like why those might still have some relevance today uh, a little bit afterwards. There's sort of this encoder decoder model, and these, these are typically derivatives of things like T5. You'll, you'll typically see them because they'll have five in the name somewhere. But they, they have this notion of like, let's try to do a lot of inputs, do a lot of different outputs, um, and allow us to sort of do that type of representation. And then a lot of the, the work recently is really in this sort of decoder only style, like so, so specifically things you'll see GPT in uh, as well. And I want to mention GPT and this specific notion of GPT, because as I was talking about sort of domain-specific models before, there's still really this maybe unreasonable power uh, coming out of some of these general models. So I, I think what was, was sort of interesting initially, and again, maybe defied my expectations, is because I, I went into it believing, you know, really, we, we need to have lots of in-domain data to do well for a variety of these tasks. But what we consistently sort of have seen is that, you know, out of the box, like zero shot even, GPT does really well on a variety of these medical questions. Um, there's a strong argument to be made about medical questions not actually being the most important thing for a variety of the other clinical tasks we care about. Nevertheless, it's maybe a really interesting proof point um, to see that you know, it's, it's performing very well, um, often at you know, human level performance for a variety of different tasks. Um, and this is interesting not because I'm, I'm certainly not worried about uh, you know, doctors being replaced, but I think it is really this interesting facet where uh, 
you know, I think, you know, there's a quote from Zach here, but I think actually one of the others that's, that's rather interesting is really this notion that like maybe doctors using AI will outpace doctors not using AI over the long term. And so, you know, we might have this intuition, like I said, that GPD wouldn't do well. So, so like why might it do well in biomedicine? Well, we, we don't know exactly what it was trained on, but we've been led to believe it's been trained on sort of the internet at large, which could be anything. And the internet, of course, contains tons of biomedical text. So, you know, if we look at sort of these, these maybe common crawl resources like, like Pile, one of the most central components of Pile is actually PubMed. It's, it's this huge, huge text corpus that exists, um, both the combination of PubMed abstracts and then also the full text articles that exist in PubMed as well. And so, so maybe that's where some of this power is coming from. And it sort of leads us to this sort of dynamic that we can think about, you know, in terms of these general models, so things like GBT having this ability to be steered in a really nice way, like this prompting mechanism is a really nice way to interact with some of the models. Um, but as we sort of go down this chain, they might, things might become a little bit harder to steer, but maybe more specific. Um, and they're often smaller models as well. So we might think about this, this dynamic where we have sort of these large general models that are really easy to steer. Uh, but then on the other side, we have sort of the, the basis of some of those models and some of the domain-specific pre-training that we do that's really maybe a little bit more difficult to steer, but often smaller and uh, a little bit more specialized as well. So I realize we're, we're coming through time pretty quickly here, so I'll try to uh, cover the last section uh, reasonably quickly, but I think, I think it's sort of an interesting section. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this general uh, set, of, set of projects, um, and hopefully it'll open up some, some conversations this afternoon as well. So, the, the first one maybe is this, uh, this exercise in sort of prompting. Um, specifically, you know, you know, for, for uh, those of you who are, have been sort of paying attention to the broad literature, you know, there's a ton of interest in MedPalm 2, MedPalm M, a, a number of these other uh, projects. But one of the things that we had observed early on was that you know, if we look to this, um, this model, it specifically required a lot of adaptation to do well on some of these tasks like USMLE. So this is, this is like I said before, there's sort of this notion that maybe the, the sort of lower bound of what we should expect from any of these models is this sort of zero shot performance, but there's a lot of things we can do in context learning, chain of thought, all these other sorts of things to really like bolster some of the performances that we see. And so it, it opened up this sort of natural question of, you know, like we can do a lot of fine tuning here. Um, you know, and in, in, in the specific paper, they were looking at a pretty elaborate sort of prompting scheme with up to sort of 44 calls uh, per problem, but they were able to get this really exceptional performance as part of that. Um, so, so what if, for example, you know, we did a similar type of thing because we knew that GPT had actually out of the box pretty, pretty strong performance. What if we sort of came up with a similar prompting strategy for GPT? And so we looked at this, this sort of problem um, where rather than sort of doing a, a more limited call to GPT, we decided, you know, like, let's actually explore what the performance would look like if we start incorporating not just zero shot uh, or sort of like a random few shot like was sort of done in the, the previous comparison, but we actually wanna move past that to some really sort of more intricate strategies for prompting. So, so this notion of um, maybe chain of thought uh, using uh, Kane nearest neighbor's few shot, uh, or even just sort of this like ensemble as well. And, and what was really fascinating about this is that, you know, the performance that we end up seeing increases as, as sort of expected, but increases very, very significantly. Um, and this is, in part quite nice because the actual prompting strategy that we used is now packaged up into, a, a, it's a package called prompt base that can be used by others and really will then in turn allow you sort of out of the box to sort of realize some of these higher performances for, for these models as well. Um, and of course, you know, again, I think these are, these are sort of interesting tasks that we're benchmarking against, uh, but the, the really interesting thing is not just for these specific tasks, but maybe for the tasks that you all have in mind. I'll also talk uh, maybe a little bit about self-verification because one of the most common concerns that I hear about with the use of LLMs in, in clinical settings is you know, this notion of hallucinations, biases, um, data privacy, um, you know, explainability, transparency, a, a whole bunch of these other sorts of issues as well. The specific thing we're gonna talk about here is, is the hallucinations piece. I, I'm, gonna, I'm happy to talk afterwards about some of these other pieces as well. I think especially like retrieval augmented generation for data privacy and for some of the other pieces here is, is really quite important as well. We've been doing work in that space too. But if we think about the hallucinations, you know, I, I actually personally was quite worried about uh, hallucinations in the context of peer review. Um, and, and I was worried about it specifically because of this, this sort of question of can you cite your sources? 
And I think what I had found early on was that you know, time and time again, I would get you know, some, some plausible statement, and I would get some source that was, that was cited, and then I would go and I'd look at that source, and I would think to myself, okay, does the source, well, one of two things. Does the source actually substantiate the claim that's being made? Because a lot of the time it didn't. Uh, or did that source even exist? Um, and I was worried about this in the context of peer review because, as you can imagine, we already ask a lot of our reviewers and asking them to you know, meticulously review every single citation is, is pretty challenging to do as well. And so we had this sort of general notion you know, that many of us have in computer science that like, okay, verifying something is a lot easier than doing the generation process probably. So it's, a, it's sort of this like analogy to P and the P, you know, like we should be able to check it a lot easier than we should be able to actually come up with this answer. And so we, we sort of looked at this you know, self-fact check for, for a prompt program. So we, we were looking at this in the context of information extraction, and the specific pipeline that we were looking at was this one where we'd say, okay, try to do the extraction, and then force either the same agent or another GPT agent to say, tell me all the omissions that you made. Like, tell me where all the mistakes and things that you left out are, to just sort of, again, bolster that initial set. Build evidence uh, for where those things exist in, in the data that you're looking at. And this is sort of the intuition for this step is really this idea you know, that if you're walking down the street and you ask a bunch of people for directions, if they all tell you the same direction, it's probably right. Uh, if they all tell you different things, you probably want to figure out where you're headed. And so this is a very similar idea of you know, if, if a bunch of different agents sort of tell you, yeah, this is the snippet of text that corresponds to this finding, it's probably a real finding. And if they all tell you different things, you should probably be a little bit more suspicious. Incidentally, this evidence generation piece that allows us to also then, after the fact, go back and really quickly check some of these examples. And then finally, this sort of pruning step, which is mostly there to resemble sort of a classic information retrieval pipeline, where you sort of really rapidly increase recall and then you restore precision toward the end. And so what we found is, you know, we, we would sort of ask these, these prompts, uh, you know, again, with some, some context up front, you're an expert disease inspector, we need you to find all these diseases, and we'd sort of you know, hand it off some, some bit of data, look at it, ask it to extract the diseases, find the omissions that were made, generate evidence from the text for those omissions. So now we can see, for example, that you know, this finding of pneumonia um, actually maybe is a real finding because there is a portion of the text that actually lends to that, that specific finding. Um, and then you know, once we have generated that evidence, again, very easy to sort of verify that evidence. So like in, in this second piece where we're looking at uh, endocarditis, we look at the corresponding evidence that was found, and actually you know, the, the underlying text is saying there's, there's no endocarditis. We've, we've ruled that out. And so it's very easy for us to then triage quite quickly what some of the underlying labels are in these cases. And so what's nice about this is this GPT-4 with this sort of self-verification got us very close to the self-supervised state of the art. Um, you know, and I think this was a nice sort of finding. We then actually took this same model and we decided, okay, well, this is interesting, but we actually need to deploy this in a, in a, a much more confined setting where we don't have access to as many GPUs. So let's go ahead and try to do some knowledge distillation. Specifically, let's try to use GPT and, and PubMed BERT in order to do this sort of noisy teacher model. And what we were able to find was, you know, we're able to train a model that had substantially improved performance, but was over a thousand times smaller. And so this is actually, from a, from a practical standpoint for a lot of the hospitals that we work with, a very nice finding as well. And, and so what we sort of land on in, in this knowledge distillation space is really this idea that, you know, we, we can use GPT in a variety of different ways, and we can use, you know, some of these other more bespoke models for some very specific things that we'd like in, in the context of uh, health deployments. And so I will touch uh, in the remaining few minutes here uh, on some, some facets of sort of multimodal models, because I think this is actually, like I said, one of the really exciting spaces that we're all moving into so that we can build much more holistic representations of patients. And, and this is, you know, if we think about, um, you know, if we think about any of the patients that we, that we work with, typically they, they don't just generate one type of data. They have many different things that uh, make up sort of the data story about them. Um, and incidentally, you know, as you can imagine from before, when I was talking about sort of the, the types of data, um, you know, maybe this is not a, a good representation of speech data, but it is certainly a compelling one if you were generating them for slides. So uh, maybe, maybe really quickly, uh, one of the things that sort of motivated us in this case was this idea of immunotherapy. Um, you know, we, we've been looking at, again, a lot of the, the cancer space. 
And when we think about some of the immunotherapies, we have a lot of the text data for these patients. But actually, one of the things that's most bearing is probably a lot of the things related to their, the, the tumor microenvironment and the biomarkers for that patient. And so these are other signals that are maybe more bearing than some of the data that we have. And so we, this is one of the motivations for us to move into multimodal. And we, you know, I, I think what's interesting is multimodal in the general domain, as I said, you can generate some really interesting things. We, we did some work specifically on chest x-rays and CT. And you know, this, is, this is an example from a general domain model about you know, give me a photo of a lung CT. And this, again, looks really cool for the purpose of a slide is not gonna look very plausible to a radiologist, and so one of the things that we were looking at was, you know, can we actually generate more real examples? Um, and this, this middle one is a, is a work that is looking at sort of this reference example, um, but I've actually talked with several of you here earlier today about some of the work that you're doing in this space, and I'm actually I'm very excited about uh, some of the things that are being done already that retain some of the underlying uh, physiological uh, anatomy that's, that's there as well. So I'll maybe really briefly mention two projects that we're doing. So the, in, in general, there's a, a, a tremendous amount of interest in this space. I, I won't go too far into this, um, but you know, one of the things that sort of emerged is this notion of, of CLIP being a, a reasonable way, if you have paired data, to create sort of an image encoder. And so one of the things that we've looked at is sort of, can we create large-scale data sets for that are paired for some of these CLIP style models. And so in this recent work, Biomed CLIP, we assembled a, a, actually now over 30 million uh, figure caption pairs. It's probably closer to 40 million now that we'll hopefully be able to make available to, to everyone soon. And what's nice about this model is it does really well relative to some of the other general domain CLIP and even things like PubMed CLIP on some of the, some of the tasks that we care about. Uh, in, increasingly, you know, when we're using things like um, this large-scale biomedical data, we might even see that we're able to outperform some of the things that are trained specifically on clinical data just because of the, the volume of the underlying data. And maybe the last thing I'll talk about is, you know, as we're thinking about now that we have sort of LLMs, biomedical LLMs, and the corresponding image encoders, what does it look like to move to sort of uh, like a copilot style interface? So something where you're able to show an image and you're able to actually have an interaction about that image. And that's what we were trying to do in, in LavaMed. Uh, which is a lava-based model where we say, let's take some of the underlying biomed clip data, let's use GPT-4 as this mechanism to, you know, for universal annotation to create a large multimodal instruction following set. So this is the, the type of data that we would need to sort of further tune a uh, base lava model is this sort of instruction following set and use um, you know, specifically this instruction following set to create a biomedical version of, of this lava model. And again, you know, we, we have sort of a, a variety of different types of data in, in this data set because we're pulling it from PubMed Central. But we do have a lot of things that are, you know, chest x-rays, pathology slides, um, all of these other sorts of data, which is why we see, you know, strong biomedical performance for this model. But I think more than focusing on one specific model, I think what's really interesting about this is that, you know, the, the, this underlying notion that we have sort of like an LLM and we are able to take an encoder and project into that latent space because that actually defines sort of a class of models rather than a single model. So we can think about LAVA as sort of like a LAMA base with a clip encoder and a linear projection, but then we can think about, you know, LAVA Med is a close variant of that where we're just using a LAVA LM and then a Biomed clip and a linear projection. We can also think about other projects like MedPalm M as, you know, using a different language model, a different vision encoder things like Elixir, uh, or even things like MedFlamingo, where you're looking at you know, something very similar in the, the language model and the image encoder, but a, a different projection. So I, I think this is really interesting. You know, there, there's this notion that we might be able to use multimodal as, as you know, not just this universal structuring tool that we were using LLMs for, but sort of this like, universal translator between the different uh, modalities. And just to sort of uh, wrap things up here, I think there's, there's still maybe uh, some opportunities to have this sort of like population level health LLM. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with sort of like two questions that have been on my mind recently. One of them is, uh, you know, when we think about these LLMs and these various scaling laws that we've seen for multimodal and for, for language, you know, what is the equivalent of this like multimodal health scaling law? And then what are specifically emergent health capabilities when we think about some of the emergent capabilities 
that exist in, in uh, LLMs or, or large multi-model models as well. Um, and with that, I'll wrap it up and thank you know, the many people who have worked on this, our, our former interns, our, the rest of my group, um, and, and our close collaborators at Providence and Fred Hutch and uh, Jackson Laboratories as well. Cool. Thank you very much for, for the talk. I definitely have a lot of things to talk to you about. Uh, anybody who wants to ask a question? Can pass it on the microphone. So one question that I have, um, I want to push back a little bit on, uh, on this notion that like, how far we are from like, having a general model for various tasks. So specifically about the uh, uh, application of the chat GPT for, for example, part of speech tagging. So as our work is in, specifically in the, uh, in the radiology context, there has been a couple of years ago, uh, you know, Shakespeare's model that is like an adaptation of the birth for identifying like, you know, anatomical concept and the pathology related to that and then representing it for, um, uh, you know, as a, as a, gra a bipartite representation. And it works really well for Shakespeare, uh, you know, uh, X-ray data set. The same model, when it wants to be adopted, for example, the same different application in, in radiology, for example, breast imaging, uh, while we still have the same problem, we have to annotate a lot of data. Where do you think we are uh, in terms of like, replacing, for example, those tr specifically trained uh, NLP tasks for other applications still in the same context of radiology for different organs? Do you think that right now we don't really need that and we can just replace it with uh, ChatGPT4? And uh, is there any benchmark? So this is a really good question. And I, I think um, there, so there, there are a couple of things that I can say that are maybe optimistic about it. But maybe I'll start with the ones that are a little bit more cynical. So I, I think there's maybe a cynical view of this where we think about something like Chexpert and we think about the underlying data sets that were available for it. And, and most of that work uh, and the, the underlying model there are, are sort of you know, publicly available, right? So, so there, there could be this um, really concerning idea that maybe actually GPT was just trained on that. Like we don't know, right? Um, but this is the, you know, it would be an unsurprising finding that if, if it was trained on that, that it could do well on it. Um, I, I think maybe the, the other thing that lends me to believe that it would be really difficult um, for this, this specific, um, you know, specifically, there's a set of, okay, maybe what I should say is there are a specific set of modalities that are like well represented, even if they're not uh, directly trained on. So, so, like when we look at the PubMed data, for example, there are a lot of chest radiographs in figures and captions and sort of all these sorts of things. Um, for this specific example of like breast radiography, there are some really interesting subtleties in language that are different than what we see for general radiology. So I was talking about this with, with some folks earlier, but there's um, the, the way that uh, regions are defined in language often rely on sort of uh, like clock positions and then also inner outer, so the like quadrant positioning. And this is very difficult, I, actually sorry, as a human, the first time I saw this, this was very difficult for me to understand. Um, and I made a ton of mistakes. And so I think, Knowing you know, what we've seen about some of the concerns of large language models with numerics and a whole bunch of other sort of like positional uh, or like spatial sort of pieces, maybe there's an argument for why that specific task might actually be much more difficult than we expect. Um, and, and so I, I think in general, especially if we don't have like any sort of data that lends to that, it, then maybe, maybe that's why we wouldn't expect sort of that like transferability that we'd see. Maybe optimistically, it would be interesting to see um, if we did have some better labeled data, what, like, like how much would it take um, for sort of like some of the specific models that you're developing to do this task? And then how well could we get a general domain uh, or like a, a more generalist model to try to do this? And, and I, I think what I'd actually be most interested in is like how many examples do we need for the, to bolster performance of that generalist model. But, but I, I, again, I think actually like this is a, an interesting task because it's, uh, it's sufficiently complex that I think it would be really difficult to expect a generalist model to do it. I mean, it's exactly the point that you're making, I guess like perhaps it can take us to the place that we want to with like less number of uh, like labeled data, that would be the value that it, it can offer. So that would be interesting to see. 
Any yeah. other question from the audience? There is a question on the computer from someone who watched virtually, so I can just read that out. Yeah. Um, thank you for the great talk. What do you see the role of interpretability be in the age of multimodal LLMs? Where with language and notes, the self-verification of evidences can be used to have a clinician trust the model output for other modalities, such as ones you mentioned from the multimodal data. Interpretation of the modal outputs would be less straightforward to do. So it kind of, the question was at the beginning, I can repeat it again. Okay, I, I think I, so I think I have a hold of the question, but if I answer it and I miss a part, uh, whoever wrote it, write another thing and then let me know. Um, or, or follow up with me off, offline as well. So I, I think maybe foremost there's this question of like, what do we actually need in terms of interpretability in, in the context of machine learning for health? And I think this has actually been sort of a hotly debated thing. There's a, a, a clinician that I'd uh, spoken with a, a long time ago. He used to be at University of Toronto. He's actually now in the Boston area um, named Peter Lawson. I, I think one of the things that I, I, I really enjoyed about his talk is he said, you know, look, as clinicians, we constantly say we have to have interpretability. We'll never trust this model without it. But at the same time, I'm a black box. Like you actually have no idea why I, as a human, performed some procedure, or you know, like you assume you know, and it's because we have sort of this like shared set of values and shared training, and and also because you can ask me afterwards and I can give you some justification for why it is. But I am not like innately interpretable as a human, and no one else is either. And so why are we expecting that to be a property of some of the models? And I thought that was a, a really interesting point around like. You know, maybe, um, like I think we often say like, if we had interpretability, then we would trust these models. And I don't know that that's actually, uh, like that might be something we would desire, but it's maybe not sufficient to actually really trust a model just to have that interpretability. Um, the, the other piece that's sort of there too is, you know, what would it take for us to trust some of these models in practice? And that, I think this is one of the things that, you know, especially as I think about some of the deployments that I like to see some of these models in, one of the, the biggest concerns is not so much, you know, we, we know some of the properties of these models that we deploy. We also know, you know, even in any of the numbers that we're reporting, we're, ne we're never reporting an AUC of one, right? We're always reporting with some error. And so one of the things that is most useful to think about from a deployment standpoint is how do we actually deploy in a context to mitigate some of the, the errors that we know are going to be made? And so when we think about sort of, you know, how does that apply to this machine learning for health space, there are a lot of other reframings um, that don't rely as heavily on just like the, the current uh, metrics of performance that we use, but really like how to do prediction or classification and abstain when there's uncertainty. So, so like the, there's a whole separate literature on that. Um, but maybe the, the second part of this question is really, doesn't interpretability get much harder when you have more than one modality? And, and I think the answer is maybe, maybe yes. Um, you have an opportunity to maybe provide the interpretation in whatever modality is easiest or most convenient, but in general, maybe it's, it, it is difficult to do. Um, but it's also incredibly important, in part because when we think about generalizability from site to site or across time or just in this general machine learning sense, the interpretability also stands to help us understand what, that, what our expectations can be around generalizability. And when we don't see generalizability, like what's happening, like what, you know, is it really the case that we had some shortcut uh, at the original training site that allows us to get really high or seemingly high model performance, but then we didn't actually train a model that is doing what we thought it was doing. We're just sort of observing some other confounder. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. To address the issue of high quality labeled data sets, which typically mm -hmm. require experts who may have inter-rater uh, reliability with, among themselves and happen on small scales to get really high quality data, has there been any thought about how to improve that infrastructure or pipeline? Um, my experience has been that Typically, it will be a couple of clinicians who are committed to doing this on their time off or trying to train different medical students who are available, but obviously that's not um, what will help these LLMs scale in terms of being able to get sufficient information for these high quality data sets. So this is a great question. So, so maybe one thing that I, so there are people, there, there is some literature about how to do this. I actually think one of the things I have been thinking about recently, 
is that um, in our traditional sort of machine learning framing of annotation tasks, we often assume that there's, that there's a gold truth. Like, like there's a gold label, there's an underlying truth, right? And I have been in enough rooms with clinicians where they fundamentally disagree on what the answer is that, that's, that's sort of shaken my confidence in the underlying annotation scheme. So, so for, uh, maybe for anybody who's not familiar, like the, the typical annotation scheme is something where you get multiple annotators for the same data set, you look at inner annotator disagreement, for places where they disagree, you bring in someone who is maybe like more, more expert to adjudicate and pick the, the true answer. Um, but I, I think what this, you know, looking at some of these places where clinicians disagree, um, you know, it's, maybe it's the case is like the truth is that there's an acceptable distribution over truths rather than a single truth. And so I think in that context, we probably, you know, and, and this is maybe for simple things, this is not the case, right? Like for, for does, you know, uh, do, does some, uh, some symptom exist, like that, that maybe is a more binary uh, thing where there is a truth, but maybe the severity of that uh, is, is more debatable. And, and so I think what this lends to is like, we probably do need to rethink how, how we're doing annotation or what we define as like the, the answer in the clinical setting. Um, and then the other part is maybe this question of like, how, it, it is very costly to generate labels, right? And so how do we open that up or democratize that the same way that we did for, for general domain. And I, I think there are some cases where, where we probably can, but I think a lot of the cases that I've seen, and, I, and this might be just because I did NLP, and if you think about like what we do often in NLP, we come up with uh, very clever ways to not have to annotate data. Like I, I sadly found myself wondering recently, like should I have just spent a month of my, of my graduate career just annotating data that? It would have been really painful but instead I spent you know, a month coming up with some increasingly clever way to not have to do any annotation but still get some like, meaningful result. Um, and so, so one of the answers is probably we need to identify what are the things that are really high value and then just like, actually invest in getting labeled data for those spaces. But then it's probably that and a combination of you know, these workarounds that allow us to uh, get meaningful data even if it is sort of noisy or weak uh, as, as sort of a signal and then bolster that to sort of improve performance over time as well. Thank you. So, uh, you know, in, uh, for general supervised classification model, we have seen that there is a problem of shortcut, you know, or any kind of biasness. Now, right now we are mostly developing multimodal models where we are aligning the image and language. So what if, the multimodal uh, model will gonna pick up any shortcut or spurious correlation or even any biased feature, and they will gonna try to align the language and the, 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 the image. So do you have any take on that? Because people are developing more and more multimodal models, but I've seen, I, I have not seen much of the things like, if, if, they, if, if a model can pick up any spurious correlation to align them. So I want to know any, your take, yeah. So I think this is a great question. I, I think in, I was trying to touch on this a little bit with the interpretability piece, because I think that is one of the things that will allow us to understand, you know, are these correlations being used to actually drive the prediction? I, I think in, in the multimodal setting, what we often hear m more frequently is about, like, what if one modality is actually driving the performance? So, you know, maybe you do have image and you have text, but the way that the corresponding task is framed, like, you actually only needed one or the other. Like, you, you could have, you know, done, 95% of the same performance just using the text. And I, I feel like there's a lot of, con in general domain, I think there's a lot of concern about that specific problem. And it, it's, it's not the same, certainly, but it's maybe related to this problem of like, what if those shortcuts or those spur spurious correlations exist in one of the modalities but not in the other? Will it make us, uh, will it make them even more difficult to find? Um, and I think this is, I think, actually, my intuition is that it probably will. Um, again, I think there are opportunities to say, like, okay, well, we can, we can easily do these ablations where we start to hold out certain modalities and try to identify and triage, like, where, where effectively that, that correlation might be coming from. Um, but I think what we're going to have to do, you know, in the, in the sort of near future is come up with methodology that sort of says, like, here is the best practice for some of these multimodal models for how to evaluate their generalizability to new sites so that we make sure we're not picking up some of the spurious correlations, but also to make sure that both the modalities are actually in use um, 
or or alternatively, like that there's an acceptable uh, like an acceptable usage of each modality, so that we're not like, we're not just training uh, effectively like a larger capacity model uh, for for one of these modalities. Cool. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so my question is, is kind of a follow up to the previous question where, uh, where in settings you have labels that you're uncertain about where the inner agreement is low. Um, and related to like recent OpenAI post about uh, this potential of having like uh, models that are over human capabilities. And so when you have labels that are low quality or of human quality, but then the model have uh, above human performance, have you looked into maybe ways to um, deal with that situation where like GPT-4, for example, can do better than Surgeon, but how do you like really trust it? Or um, how to make better performance when the label is noisy and when a uh, human can only do so good on a task? Yeah, so I, I think there's, there's already some literature around, you know, like if you have the notion of disagree, so basically like there was a while back some notion around how do we construct loss functions if we have some idea of um, like the inner annotator disagreement for a specific label. So, so the idea is really like maybe during training time we don't penalize a model for getting something wrong if a lot of people get it wrong. Um, and so this was sort of this like idea of how can we better approximate human performance. I think the, the sort of second part of this question that you brought up was like, it's it, it sort of, if you have superhuman performance, you might have a human that says effectively like this label is wrong, even though actually it's right by, you know, agreement of other humans or something like that. And so I think this sort of touches, so there's sort of two things that are interesting here. So, so one of them is, um, in the context of OpenAI, if they have a whole bunch of feedback and sort of telemetry coming in off of these things, you know, the, the, the real sort of um, like label is, is sort of this question of what does the specific user want to see produced in some sense, right? So it's, it's some combination of like factuality and then also like alignment to that specific user. Um, I, I think the, the place that I've encountered this before is so often for a lot of the models that we develop, we'll end up doing some form of error analysis with clinicians afterwards, you know, whether it were, or, or during the course of model development, right? And so in one of the, the cases, so like this um, tumor staging criteria model that we were working with, we went back to some of the clinicians and said, okay, you know, look, there's a couple of classes of mistakes that these models seem to be making. Can you tell us, you know, from your experience why, why these are wrong? Because it's not clear to us why they're wrong. And so we went through a few of the examples and for one of the classes, they just said, oh no, that's actually right. Like this data was just abstracted incorrectly. And so that's a really interesting case where I, I think it's maybe analogous in the sense that the model that we had, you know, I, I don't want to claim that it was like a superhuman model or anything like that, but you know, it's, it's actually making an inference that turns out to be correct, just not correct with respect to the labels that we were given. And so I, I think you know, in general, what we're gonna see is we're gonna have tons and tons of data. They're all gonna be providing some signal um, some of that signal will be right, some of that signal will be wrong, and the hope is, of course, that like, the right signal sort of dominates and, and so becomes the thing that we start answering with over time. Um, so yeah, so maybe, maybe too generic an answer, but I, I'm happy to follow up too and try to provide a more specific answer as well. Um, there's another question. How robust do you think is the idea of using LLMs to evaluate the output of LLMs, especially in tasks where there is scarce human annotated data? <laughs> yep, uh, I guess I should have anticipated. I feel like this is like a huge debate right now on the entire community of can we use our tools to evaluate our tools. Um, I, I think there are places where this, so, so I think that the general answer is like, this is maybe concerning for lots of reasons. Um, there are a few cases where I think maybe it makes sense. You know, I, I think especially in the context of training some of these smaller models that are maybe still LLMs but not quite the like, same scale, and then using another LLM to sort of evaluate the output. The, I, I don't wanna say like it's providing you know, like the same thing as human annotation, but it's a proxy for human annotation. So maybe if you think about it in the context of like noisy labels and you sort of set up the rest of your experimental setup to interpret those as noisy labels, like that, that actually might be as fine. Um, to the sort of other, the like more specific question of, uh, 
should we believe evaluation points uh, or numbers that are reported when we use uh, GPT to evaluate GPT, for example? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, at, at times, it is just sort of the best option that we have in absence of being able to get lots of humans to evaluate things. But I, I think we all sort of have the same intuition, which is like, you're using it as a proxy for, for what you're actually trying to do. And so just you know, keep that in mind as you're, as you're doing this evaluation as well. Yeah, so uh, thank you for your presentation. So my question is that, uh, so we have seen this uh, greater progress of uh, developing this uh, deep learning method for healthcare, but our eventual goal is to apply this method to real world application. So I want to uh, ask, uh, so how do you think of the challenges or obstacles for applying this deep learning method in real world application? Yeah, I, so this is like the most, so I think in the machine learning for health community in general is one of the things we, I think we've all talked about for a long time, which is like we have this, thankfully we have this sort of like growing field, right? We even have many venues now that sort of cater specifically to this intersection of machine learning and health, but often they're talking about sort of these like academic projects or proofs of concept as opposed to like concrete deployments, right? And so I, I think, you know, there's maybe two ways to, that, that I've been thinking about this at least. So I, I think one of the things is, I think there is more opportunity for deployment than we often think there is. I think one of the, the challenges though is often when we're doing uh, some of these projects that are more academically oriented, we're, we're targeting these like tasks that are very much at the, for, like, at the point of care. So we'll, we'll target maybe something like a diagnosis or something else. Um, and, and that, that like the, the appropriate place to sort of integrate that is, is maybe, again, at the point of care, which is a very difficult place to actually do the deployment. By contrast, there's actually a lot of places in healthcare um, that typically are, are sort of maybe bucketed into this like set of administrative tasks. So, so if you think, for example, about like the, the medical abstraction or, or tumor staging criteria or something like this, there's a lot of people who are doing this task on the back end, not in real time either. Like they're doing this, after all the data is generated, they're pouring through this data and they're, they're abstracting out this information. And, and those areas are maybe actually really great opportunities for deployment, specifically because they're not real time, so they don't affect uh, you know, like the ongoing care practice. They reflect a real burden for a lot of the hospitals. Like the, if, if you, you know, I, I always approach these problems from a place of if we could actually help accelerate things here, we could start answering much more interesting clinical research questions, but I'm sure that there's somebody in a hospital who's thinking about this is like, this is a huge cost for us, and if we could reduce that cost, we could actually go back to providing care. Similarly, there's a lot of things that even do start to touch that patient encounter, but are sort of, again, like back end. So, so things like, for example, helping doctors actually re relieve uh, some of the documentation burden that they have, like that, that's a huge opportunity that does not have to be done in real time also. So I, I think maybe the, the sort of first part of this is when I think about sort of deployments in general, like how do we move from a research community to more deployments, I think pretty often about what are all of the, the types of research that we should be doing that are more amenable to deployment in the sense that they could be more easily integrated from a hospital system standpoint. And then the, the sort of second part of this, and, and maybe this is actually one of the reasons that I, I sort of made this, this jump over to, um, you know, a, a, albeit a very academically oriented uh, research group, but, but still sort of industry, is, is this idea that, you know, a lot of the time when we're doing these deployments, you, a lot of the hospitals that we work with, you know, they have, some, they, they have some risk tolerance, right? And so if they're thinking about something that's like a real tool being deployed, they probably need a whole bunch of other sort of guarantees around that tool. And it's not always clear that like as an individual, we can actually come up with that tool that is gonna be magically like self-maintainable and uh, never break and, and you know, all those sorts of properties. And so I think what is, the, the other thing that I've been thinking about from a deployment standpoint is, is not so much like how do I actually just work with a large engineering team and get some of these things into practice, but what are the sort of specific hooks that we can create where we can define like a, an important task reasonably and provide a framework or some platform around that for the research community to start iterating on um, so that it's a lot easier for you know, an individual researcher to sort of come in and say, I think I can do, you know, I think I can build a better model 
let me test this model in, in context of the way it's being deployed, but just work with that interface a lot more easily as opposed to sort of like the more bespoke models that we, we create now. Because I think even right now, what we often see is like the data that we're training on, uh, for many of us that's probably Mimic, uh, maybe does not lend well to some of the, the other deployment scenarios that we might want to deploy in as well. Great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you all.